All right, good morning. Anybody feel a little off from daylight savings time or whatever this is? Just raise your hand, be loud, be proud. I'll take that hand, and if your neighbor falls asleep, you can use that same hand to go like this. Just today, though, it's a one-day deal. It's not usually normal in church, so don't do it every week. But today, that's, that's, I, you can do it. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 3 this morning, John 3, 1 to 21. Uh, we are in a series on the Gospel of John, obviously, uh, and it's going to culminate uh, around the Easter time frame, uh, obviously, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and we will not be able to hit every verse in the book of John, but we're going to look at episodes uh, through the book of John leading up to Easter. And today we're in John 3, 1 to 21. So when I was a kid, we used to watch baseball in my uh, living room. Yeah, I, I don't love it, but we did it. It's kind of boring, right? It's like... I'm just kidding. It doesn't move like soccer. It's, uh, it's way better. I, I should stop now, right? It's like half the church is gone after this, you know. But we used to watch baseball, and I actually did enjoy getting together and watching baseball. And uh, inevitably, there would be some guy in the crowd or some gal in the crowd with a sign. And what did it say? John 3.16. He was just hoping to get on the camera. And millions of people were saved because of that sign. I don't know. Maybe they were. Maybe they, they weren't. But John 3.16 is, is, Amer- is American as baseball and apple pie, right? I mean, it is, uh, it is something that kind of everybody knows, and because everybody knows it, we fly by it like it was nothing. And what I want to do is sort of park in this passage today because we really need to understand the context of the conversation. Uh, a lot of times we know John 3.16, for God to love the world that he gave his only son, but we have no idea why Jesus was saying that. And so I want to back into that today with you. And just walk through it slowly uh, so we can understand the profound nature of the goodness of God shown to us through his son Jesus and the power of salvation and and what it means to be born again, which sounds like an old, you know, Baptist term, but it's an old Jesus term. And I want us to look at it. So stand with me. We'll read John chapter 3, 1 to 21 together. If you're new or you're our guest, we say this phrase, the very words, uh, to distinguish God's word from my own. Here's what the scripture says. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say, I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know And bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who ascended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment 
the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You can be seated. I think in order to understand John 3.16, we have to understand the conversation it's framed in. And so we uh, get a guy named Nicodemus uh, here in John chapter 3, verse 1. It says that there was a man of, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So that tells us a lot about Nicodemus. Um, Nicodemus theologically and by training as a Pharisee, which means that he has trained, uh, gone all through the, the rabbinic discipleship process, kind of in the, in the Jewish context. He has uh, memorized the Torah. He has memorized the writings and the prophets. He accepts the, the, the writings and the oral tradition and as a Pharisee setting him apart for, from another group called the Sadducees, he believes in the resurrection of the dead. He knows that one day a Messiah will come, that there will be resurrection. He's looking for that based on the context of, of his, his, uh, his house of learning. A Pharisee puts them in a place of authority. So being a, a Pharisee in that, that land among those people makes him, uh, in our vernacular, sort of pastoral influential, authoritative when it comes to the things of God. And the things of God are so enmeshed in that culture, it's not like you compartmentalize God in that culture. It's all Torah. That is the law of the land. Now, not only is he a Pharisee, but the scripture says, this describes him as a ruler of the Jews. Someone who gets that title, a ruler of the Jews, is in the top 70 of all of the ruling authorities in Israel. He's in the Sanhedrin, which is a council of 70 made up of Pharisees, Sadducees, and also it's headed by the high priest um, in Israel. So if you were to think about it sort of in our terms, we think about the Sanhedrin as the supreme court. I mean, this was uh, an authoritative group. Um, the highest of teachers, the most influential of teachers in the land. And so, uh, so Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he calls him rabbi. If you just follow this, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus of the 70, highest highest teachers in the land, he comes to Jesus and he acknowledges him politely as rabbi. And he acknowledges him as one who is from God. And so that's polite. What you need to understand is that also Nicodemus would see himself in a class system much higher than Jesus. And he would view Jesus as one from Nazareth who is a tecton, he works with his hands, he's a stonemason, he's in a low class system. So he comes to him in a very Jewish way and honors him in order to make him comfortable with what's coming next. Okay? So <clears throat> sometimes people look at this and think Nicodemus is just coming at night because he's scared because he want, doesn't want everybody to know and he wants to be saved. And I don't think that's what it is. I think Nicodemus is coming to question because he's seen these signs being worked out in Jesus. And this is one who is a tecton from Nazareth. But in the introduction, he sort of, he sort of levels the playing field. He's, he, he, he's polite to him. And if you just follow the text a little bit more, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these uh, signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, Nicodemus never asks a question here before Jesus answers him. Uh, Jesus steps in. This is interesting because, because if you have, if you have 
in the context of that culture, a greater and lesser party, just outside looking in, we know Jesus is the son of God, but just outside looking into that conversation, Nicodemus from just the innocent bystander watching, oh, there's Jesus from Nazareth, and there's Nicodemus. Nicodemus, what he's wearing, how he's dressed, who he is versus Jesus. Jesus and Nicodemus is the higher party in this conversation. And so he should be asking the question. But Jesus steps in before there's ever a question. And he gives what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna point out to you as three amens. It is uh, the phrase, truly, truly. Truly, truly, I say to you. It can also be translated, amen, amen, I say to you. It's like, so be it. It is so true. We are doubling these amens. We are doubling these trulies. And you see these in John chapter 3, 1 to 14. But take a look at the first one in John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered him, which he didn't ask a question, but Jesus answered him, Amen and amen, or truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So This is where Jesus wants the conversation to go with Nicodemus, the ruler of Israel. And this is where it does go, three double amens. Now, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You have to understand also, and this is true for you, but sometimes we don't connect with it. Not seeing the kingdom of God is the worst possible thing that could ever happen to anyone. Bar none. No eternal life, no walking in the kingdom, no uh, being in relationship with God, and, and specifically for uh, a first century Jew who understands like, much of David's writing, much of, of the, the writings are all about, let me dwell in your house forever. And Jesus is saying, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That is like the worst thing that could ever happen to anyone, including Nicodemus. There is no way to see the kingdom unless you're born again. Now, this language gets echoed throughout the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So Paul has this idea in mind that if you are in Christ, what was you, what, what was your life, it's gone. It's old. You're, you've been made a new creation, created all over again in Jesus. Peter has the same thought, 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to the inher an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In other words, Peter was encouraging persecuted Christians and saying, hey, God, according to his mercy through his son Jesus, he's made you to be born again. He's given you a, a, a new identity that offers living hope. It comes through resurrection, uh, through the resurrection of Jesus, and it includes inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, and you will see it in the last days. And so no matter how bad it gets, this is as close to hell as you ever get because you have the kingdom of God. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God because you've been born again. It would be the worst thing in the world to happen to anyone to not be able to see the kingdom of God. And Jesus leads like this. Unless one is born again, he or she cannot see the kingdom of God. Now remember who Nicodemus is. He's... A God guy. Sem top 70, he's on the Sanhedrin, he's got authority. He can have Jesus arrested right there if he wants to. Nicodemus now asks a question, probably a frustrated question. How can a person be born when he is old? 
That's a pretty good question, right? I mean, if you were in this argument, how many of you are like logical, analytical people? Like, raise your hand. Come on. Be loud, be proud. How many of you are not? Also be loud, be proud. You're my people. Uh, um, analyzers, analytical people will look at this like Nicodemus, like, well, that, how is that even possible if you see uh, Nicodemus respond? Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born? Like, that's impossible. That cannot happen. How is this supposed to happen? You're saying you cannot see the kingdom of God if, you're, if you haven't been born again. How could that even be? And Jesus gives what I'm going to call the second double amen. Truly, truly, it's in verse 5 and 6. Jesus answered, truly, truly, or amen and amen, I say to you, unless one is born of the water, of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Again, this is not directly answering Nicodemus's question. Unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Again, Jesus is obsessed with the entrance to the kingdom of God in this conversation. And he wants Nicodemus to understand. Now, why water and the spirit? Well, water is an indispensable requirement for life. You got to think if you're Jesus and Nicodemus, and you're in Jerusalem at this, this time frame, or you're, in a, just, you're just located in the Judean wilderness, and that city in and of itself, there's just one spring from the Judean wilderness feeding the whole city, the Gion Spring. Water is life. You have no water, you have no life. Everybody, everybody gets that. But also, he says, you must be born of the Spirit. And what we see in the Old Testament is that water and Spirit go together a lot, often, as indispensable requirements for life. The Spirit is the breath of God giving life, right? So Ezekiel, chapter 36, 25 to 27. Just listen to the words of the prophet Ezekiel. It says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. In other words, I'll change you. I'll make you new, and then you will hear and obey me and live this best life. This new birth is spiritual rebirth. Jesus is answering Nicodemus's question from the perspective that Nicodemus is only thinking about the physical. How can one be born again? Do you have to go back into your mother's womb? And Jesus says, no, you must be born of water and the spirit. Nicodemus knows the text enough, the biblical text enough, way more than any one of us in this room. He understands that Jesus is talking about now a new birth that is a spiritual rebirth like the one that Ezekiel was talking about for God's people. This new birth, this spiritual rebirth, Jesus is saying, is required to see the kingdom of God. You cannot enter it without being born again. Now, Nicodemus brings us question number two, verse nine. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? How is that even possible? How can it be? And, and Jesus, this is interesting. So uh, it's interesting to me. You may be on like, I lost an hour of sleep time and like, whoa, 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 what are you saying? But follow this. Nicodemus said to them, how, how can this be? And Jesus answered him. Do you remember how Nicodemus said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher from God. Very polite. Like, we see these signs that you were doing. We know that you have to be from God. Jesus now turns the table a, a little bit and says, Nicodemus, uh, uh, Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not know these things? 
So whereas Nicodemus came politely and sort of tried to make Jesus at ease for the conversation in a very Eastern polite way, Jesus is not polite at all in this moment. This is Nicodemus. You're in the 70. You're the Sanhedrin. And you don't know the answers to these questions? You don't understand how these things can be? But you're the best of the best. And, and suddenly, the, 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 the authority in the conversation is shifting immensely. And then we get the third sort of amen and amen, the, the double amen. Uh, John chapter 3, um, verse 11, truly, truly, or amen and amen, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Now, here's what Nicodemus is hearing in that moment. I know something you don't know. Anybody ever heard that? I know something you don't know. This is what he's hearing. I know something you don't know because I've been places you've never been. I've come from places that you've never been. If you just just follow it, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive. I've told you earthly things and you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you Heavenly things. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. I'm telling you things I know about because I'm the Son of Man, the one that's talked about in the scripture. I've descended from heaven. And then he he pulls all the way back to this Old Testament reference that sounds weird to us. And Moses And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, there was this rod, the serpent rod called the Neshtuan, and if he lifted it up, when all the people were wounded and hurt, and they looked at it, and they were healed. And Jesus is saying, remember, O Torah, ruler of Israel, that episode in the desert when everybody looked up at the, at the serpent being lifted up and they were healed, well, they are going to all have to see the Son of Man lifted up. And when they look up and they believe and receive, they will be healed, born again, made new, recreated in a way. Paul picked up on this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 45 to 47. This is this idea that we must receive the testimony of the one who knows heaven and earth. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it's not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Jesus is saying, like, uh, uh, I am that second Adam. I am the son of man. I'm speaking to you about being born again because I know about these things, and you must receive the testimony. You must trust and believe. Nicodemus. Now, just from... John chapter 3, 1 to 21, we have no idea what Nicodemus did with that. We don't know if he trusted, if he didn't trust it, if he was skeptical, if he walked away. If We don't know all, all, all of those, those answers. But Jesus goes on to explain a little bit that I think we need to understand because many of us come to Jesus skeptical like Nicodemus. We know something of God. Um, we want to go to heaven when we die. I mean, if you ask anybody, they might not, they, they, they might not agree with you there's a heaven or a hell, but if you said, if, if there were, if we were to agree on that, would you want to go to heaven or would you want to go to hell? Would you want to be in the kingdom of God or not? Right? They would answer the question, yes, at least hypothetically, because no one wants to go to hell. Everyone wants to go to heaven, and the Bible is very clear that there is a heaven and hell, that there is a judgment of sin, 
and that there is clear distinction between those who have been forgiven of sin and those who have not. And the only way to be forgiven of sin is to be born again. And the only way to be born again is to trust and believe in Jesus, the one who was lifted up on the cross. So Paul gets it. Like the first Adam, he was in sin. The last Adam, that's Jesus. He became a life-giving spirit, and he was from heaven. And Nicodemus, I'm not sure he connects all these dots at the moment, but Jesus is telling him a lot. Like, I'm the higher party in this conversation. You're not receiving my testimony because you don't understand heavenly things. You only understand a few earthly things, even though you're, you're one of the smartest in Israel, one of the rulers in Israel, one of the teachers in Israel. You have a very limited perspective, and you need to be born all over again in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. So what do we discover about God in this? John chapter 3, verse 16 to 21. I think this is where we usually begin. But we discover some clear things about God here, and it is really good news. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So what do we learn about God? We learn that the nature of God, his nature is loving and self-giving. His nature is loving and self-giving. I don't know what you believe about God based on your own circumstances. A lot of times people will read one thing in the Bible, but believe one thing, a completely different thing based on the hard things that they've gone through in life. No, God's not loving and self-giving because this happened to me, right? And the reality is that is a skewed view, not that it happened to you, but that because it happened to you, God must not be loving is very skewed because everything we get about God written in the scripture is that he is a God of steadfast love from beginning to end. The problem is not God. The problem is sin and the impact of sin on humanity. That's the problem. And the reality is that no one can overcome. You're not going to be untouched by sin if you walk this planet. You will be impacted by your own sin. You will be impacted by the sins of other people. All of you have been. Bad things will happen to good people in this world. It will not be fair all of the time. But that does not change who God is. And remember that Jesus, fully man and fully God now, is saying, for God so loved the world. Who would know the intent of God more than Jesus? God the Father, he so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now this only son harkens all the way back to, to Abraham. Abraham, way back. Before any of this happened, Abraham had to take his son, his only son, that's what the text says, Isaac, and he brought him up to Mount Moriah, and the text tells us that the Lord asked him to lay his son on the altar and sacrifice him. Who who does that? Well, in that day, everybody, just depending on which God. And he asked him to lay his son on the altar and sacrifice him. So he does. He ties him down. He gets the wood for the fire. I mean, all this is very sort of paganistic. You got to understand about Abraham at that time. He just left Ur. He, he is, uh, he's got idols in his pockets still. He's following God, but he's still, he still gets this pagan stuff. But the difference about God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God, the Father who sent his son, his only son, the one he loved. The difference about God is that when Abraham got ready to be obedient and sacrifice his son, Isaac, to God, God provided a ram and said, don't, don't do that. Don't sacrifice your son. You take this ram, this lamb, and lay it on the altar and sacrifice that, not your son. In fact, I'm going to bless your son. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, through his line, bring salvation. 
He changed everything. That's the difference between like Baal and Molech and Dagon, all these gods from that time period, and Yahweh, God. He's the God of life. He provided substitutionary atonement, a sacrifice. And this this is what Jesus is, I mean, it's all there. When he says only son, that's all Nicodemus can hear. You have to get that. That is all Nicodemus can hear is, oh, the, the only son, like Abraham's only son, the only son. Sacrificed on Mount Moriah, but not sacrificed because a substitution was provided. Something better. His nature is loving and self-giving. God is love. He's the principal actor in salvation. In other words, he's the intender to provide salvation. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they've been born again, but it is God who initiates you being born again. He wants you to be born again. Ephesians chapter 2, 4, and 5, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Grace meaning he initiated it, he offered it to you. Without his initiation, you would not have it. This is our good and loving God. This is what we discover about God. We also discover, verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him does, is not condemned, but whoever does believe, does not believe, is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So we learn that his motive, his why, in all of this, his why is not condemnation or, de- or your destruction or your demise. Have you ever thought in life and any way, shape, form, or fashion. I think that I am cursed. I think that God is trying to kill me. I think that God is coming after me. I think that if, if, if I do this, I'm going to get struck by lightning. The other shoe is going to drop. God is going to orchestrate the events of my life in such a way that they're going to be terrible. A lot of people think those ways. A lot of people have false views of God because the enemy, he sort of lies in there with our circumstances. Like, God couldn't be that good. And what we hear here, what we understand Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is that he did not come, he did not send his son to condemn the world, but to give the world life. It's also echoed in 1 John chapter 4, 7 to 10. Listen to this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that he might live, we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. He sent his son to be the substitute. We should have been on the altar sacrifice for our sins, but he sent his son, and when we looked at him high and lifted up on that cross and believed, we were born again. We were saved. This is the God that we serve. He's not a God of condemnation or destruction. He loves us perfectly. It's us that doesn't love him perfectly. It's the other way. The other thing we learn, and it it is... uh, clarified in the book of Revelation is that all of this he is doing to restore all things. Like this this conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus is way bigger than one conversation. It is a restoration of all things conversation. Revelation 21, 4 and 5, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new Also, he said, write these things down for they're trustworthy and true. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you must be born again, all over again, be made new. But it's not that he's just making Nicodemus new. It's not that for all of us who have come to Christ that he's just making us new. But he's restoring all things so that when we get to the end of Scripture, we see he has made all things new. New. Everything will be born again. 
everything. Now, that's pretty amazing. One conversation. It's not bad for a stonemason. The ruler of Israel, Nicodemus, had to... The way those guys work, this conversation would have rolled in him for months. Every word, looking at every word, comparing it to every bit of Scripture, trying to understand and process and get what does it mean to be born again? What about the only son? What about I can't enter the kingdom of heaven? He, he, and, and to see Jesus working miracles on the side while he's processing all this. He's dealing with it. And, you know, we deal with Jesus similarly in our lives. It's just we're not Pharisees, but we can be in a different sense. It's possible. It's very possible to know all the information and not be born again. It's possible to participate regularly and not be born again. What does it take to be born again? What does it, what does it mean? What is our response to a conversation like this? What should Nicodemus' response have been? Well, rebirth or being born again is not something that we can manufacture on our own. I, I couldn't manufacture my own first birth. I had nothing to do with that. Just showed up. That was in God's hands. I can't manufacture being born again. I can't like muster it up. I can't like will it to be so much. I, I, can't, I can't say the right things. No magic word prayer is going to work. I can't manufacture that. I can't manufacture that. It's a lot more like the Ezekiel passage, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. Anybody ever had a heart of stone? Come on. I'll just raise my hand for all of us. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. I, I will soften your heart. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey. This is initiated by God. And what the scripture says is whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. Our problem is we think about belief like believing in the, um, I don't know. Believing in the, the, the giant from Jack and the Beanstalk, like he was true. Or just believing that something true because we feel like that should be true, even though it might not be. We just get this idea of belief really messed up. And the Greek word is pistuo, and I think a better word like for us to understand in our our in our culture and context, is trust. Like, do we trust him? Do we trust him? And this is our response in this, is that we have to believe, we have to trust in Jesus and receive his good news and his offer to be born again. You ever did, did done one of those trust fall crazy exercises? Like, you, you're, like I'm on the stage and somebody stand back there and catch me and I'm gonna, I'm gonna fall. Anybody ever done any one of those, those trust exercises? Like, who hates that? Yeah, especially you. I, what if I have to catch you? You don't want to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to do. And they say like, don't, don't bend at all. Just like fall straight back. We, we've got you. We'll catch you. Anybody ever been dropped on one of those trust call exercises? <laughs> yeah. You see it all the time. Like youth camp, seventh grade, kid just smacks the ground, top of the bus. We didn't catch him. Whoops. 
How many of you have trust issues? I don't, you don't have to raise your hand. Trust issues are real. I mean, trust, because people burn people all the time. People hurt people all the time. People that are close to you hurt you sometimes. Trust becomes a problem for us. And so Jesus is asking for our trust. He's saying, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you trust me. And trust is a big deal. How many of you say you have a very tight circle? Count on one hand the number of people I really trust. Because because largely trust is difficult. And Jesus, here's what he wants. He wants your heart. And he wants your trust. He wants you to receive the good news. And here's the good news. It really is good news. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him, trusted, trusted him, would not perish, but have eternal life. So can you be a Pharisee in the top 70 of the most religious people in Israel and not be born again? Yeah. Can you be a pastor and not be born again? Yeah. Can you be you and not be born again? It's possible. It's possible. Our response is trust. A lot of times right here, we like to insert, if you'll just pray this prayer with me. It's not the words the magic words, it's the intent of the trust of your soul. You're saying, I couldn't do anything about my first birth. I I have made a mess of myself. I can't do anything to be born again, just like Nicodemus couldn't do anything. But I hear you calling. I've heard the message. You've come from heaven and descended to earth, and you're speaking of things I wouldn't know of apart from you, Jesus. Now, I choose. There's something. There's some tension. He initiates it, but it's not a have to. You have to trust. What would it be to grieve the Spirit? To not trust, even though he's calling. To not trust. And this is the simple call. Anybody remember that old hymn, trust and obey, for there's no other way? It's absolutely true. There is no other way to the kingdom of God but to trust in Jesus. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And just ask him to speak to you. And look, lay all your stuff down, your, your religious stuff, your Sanhedrin stuff, your trust issues, your positions, your... And just come to him as you. Ask him to speak to you about your own salvation, about your life. Are you like Nicodemus? Must you be born again today? So, Father... Um, Your word is clear. I believe you've spoken by your spirit. And so we pray, would you save souls today? Anyone who has yet to trust you, they've tried to manufacture goodness with you, maybe by works or whatever, but they've yet trust you with their soul. God, I just pray that they could today confess with their mouth that you are Lord and believe in their heart that you've been raised from the dead. Woo them by your spirit. Save their souls. And I would just say to you, come to him repentantly and humbly in prayer. And the good news is, as soon as you say, I'm done, 
I'm trusting you. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of trying to will my way there or work my way there. I'm just going to trust you. The scripture tells us that he saves us instantly. That you've been given a new identity. That you can lay all that stuff down and, and receive what it means to be a, a child of God. An inheritance. Imperishable. Undefiled waiting for you. Father, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Encourage those who are saved to continue to walk with you and draw those who are lost to salvation. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.